Can I offer a very warm welcome to the First Minister, uh, who has come along to um, be grilled by the committee conveners uh, on her legislative programme. This is, of course, the second time that we have had a First Minister coming along in this way um, to the committee conveners. It is part of the whole reform agenda um, of making sure that government is accountable. Uh, the um, order of the meeting is I'm going to invite the First Minister just to say a few opening words about um, her programme and then I intend to go round um, all of the conveners and give everybody a good chunk of time to develop your um, points and your arguments um, with uh, the First Minister. So without any further ado, you're very welcome, First Minister. Uh, thank you very much, President Officer. And uh, as you say, this is the first opportunity I've had to attend a conveners group meeting and to use your words, be grilled uh, by the Parliamentary Committee conveners. And I know it's only the second time that a session like this has taken place. So I'm very pleased to be here. I'm looking forward, uh, I think, to the session. And at the outset, can I say, while this is a decision for yourself, presiding officer, and for the conveners collectively, I would be very happy to make this a much more regular session, and I would welcome the opportunity that that would give. Uh, the programme for government, uh, which I published and announced to Parliament in November, as uh, conveners are aware, included 12 items of legislation. Uh, one additional item of legislation, the uh, Franchise Bill to extend the vote to 16 and 17-year-olds, has since been uh, announced, uh, making it a total of 13 items of legislation. Uh, and the programme for government has a number of policy interventions over and above legislation as well. And the programme for government, legislation and non-legislative measures is grouped around the three key priorities that the government has set. And these priorities are, very briefly, uh, to build prosperity, because we all know and understand that a strong economy underpins the well-being of every community across our country. Uh, secondly, to promote fairness. We need to ensure that growth benefits all sections of our society and all parts of the country. And we know that if we succeed in making Scotland more equal, that in itself will help us with our first objective, which is to make the country more prosperous and economically successful. And the third uh, theme and strategic priority that the government has set is around participation. We want to empower and enable people to improve their own lives and those of others living in their communities. And that's a point perhaps I will finish on. Um, as a result of the referendum last year, I think uh, it's no exaggeration to say that Scotland has one of the best informed and most engaged electorates anywhere in Europe. And I'm pretty sure there will be a shared objective to encourage that sense of engagement and an important part of that, in my view, is devolving power from this parliament to local communities as our community empowerment bill is designed to do. But it's also about making our national institutions, including this parliament, as open and accountable as possible. And that's why I have said I want to lead the most open and accessible government that Scotland has had. And we are doing that partly by taking part in public discussions. We're doing so almost every month of this year. We had an event in Aberdeen just two nights ago. Uh, and it's why I'm keen to make these sessions as constructive and productive as possible. So I look forward to the opportunity that our discussions will present uh, this afternoon. Obviously, the principal purpose of this session is for me to answer your questions. Um, but I'm also very keen to take the opportunity to hear the views of conveners, which will then further inform my thinking and the thinking of my government as how we uh, face up to the challenges and build on the opportunities we face. So thank you for the opportunity to give a few opening remarks and I now look forward to your questions. Thank you, First Minister. Can I just go straight to Kevin Stewart? Uh, thank you very much, President Officer. And, uh, my first question is on fairness uh, and empowerment. How do we ensure, First Minister, um, that uh, enough resource is put into community capacity building, giving folk the, the tools uh, to, to do the things that they want to do and challenge where they need to challenge? I think that is an absolutely vital part of community empowerment. So community empowerment uh, and the community empowerment bill, as conveners are very well aware of, 
It creates new rights for community bodies and it puts new duties on public authorities. And the whole intention of that bill is to strengthen the voice of communities in the big decisions and sometimes the smaller decisions that matter to them and enable them to shape communities. But those new legislative provisions will only make the difference we want them to make in practice if individuals and groups and organisations in communities have the capacity to make use of them. And I know that was a theme that came very strongly through the Stage 1 evidence that uh, your committee took on the Empowering Communities Bill. That's why in the programme for government uh, statement that I made in Parliament, um, as well as talking about some of the provisions in the Community Empowerment Bill, I also uh, announced that we would increase the funding that we were making available uh, to community empowerment initiatives. So I indicated a, an additional £10 million, which takes total funding in this area to £19.4 million. And as an example of how we are using that funding, we're already currently supporting somewhere in the region of 80 community-led organisations specifically to help them build their capacity and become more sustainable. And that is funded through the £3 million Strengthening Communities programme, which is focused on areas uh, suffering disadvantage and inequality. So we're very mindful of the need not just to give those new powers uh, and place those duties in uh, public authorities, but also to empower and enable local communities to take advantage of them. The voices in Aberdeen the, uh, on Monday night, um, and sometimes process is the thing that holds people back from, from being able to articulate their view. Uh, Marshall Square development in Aberdeen being a prime example. How do we ensure that processes and notification is as simplified as it possibly can be so that folks can uh, have their voice heard? Well, we can do that as government in a number of ways through you know, the reforms and the improvements that we have over a number of years been trying to make to the planning process. That's one example. We can do it, and you, it's an issue we may or may not come on to later in the session around uh, the current debate about fracking, making sure that where there are big decisions on big, often controversial issues, we are making you know, a particular effort to listen to the voice of local communities. Uh, but public authorities, whether that's national government or local government, have to be mindful, not just in the, the processes that govern how they do things, but in the spirit in which they go about things, that they're listening to the public voice uh, as well. Now, you know, we're talking here about empowering communities. I uh, talked in my opening statement about my desire to see powers devolve from this place to local communities. I think we've got to recognise, though, that there will always be a tension around that agenda. Uh, you know, when people want something to be decided locally, they will uh, very much resent uh, the idea of a national government stepping in in any sense to interfere with that decision. But conversely, when people don't agree with a decision that's been taken locally, there will often be a clamour for national government to step in and overturn a decision or uh, bring about a different set of circumstances. So I think we've got to recognise and be quite open uh, eyed about that tension. But the more we can empower local communities and the more local public authorities can respond to the genuine desire of uh, communities and individuals to get involved, then the better we'll handle all of that. Thank you, First Minister. Thank you, President. Okay. Um, I'm now going to call Margaret McCulloch, Eco Opportunities Committee. Margaret. Thank you, President. Officer. Uh, First Minister, you recently spoke about the much more rigorous standards we have in the Scottish Parliament regarding equality and the budget. However, in responding to the budget equality statement, the Scottish Women's Budget Group say that equality impact assessment practice is poor in general. Would you accept that we still have got a long way to go in equality proof in the Scottish budget? And why do you think that the Women's Budget Group have been so critical of the assessment? Well, the Women's Budget Group, as uh, Margaret McCulloch will be aware, has been you know, central to our developing thinking and practice around all of this. And you know, the late Ailsa Mackay was one of the key uh, figures who informed uh, our thinking. So I you know, I guess the, the very positive thing I would say is I think all of us should be proud of the fact that we have much more rigorous uh, equality impact assessments uh, built into how we develop legislation, how we do budgets and how we assess policy. And again, uh, sort of drawing on uh, some of the objectives in our programme for government, um, I'm very keen to see us supplement that with poverty impact assessments so that we are 
you know, being very, very rigorous in challenging ourselves and testing ourselves about the impact of our policies, not just the intention of our policies. But that said, um, I readily accept, and I have, no, you know, I have no preciousness about this at all, that we've got to continue to try to improve not just the processes that we uh, have in the way we do things, but how we use those processes, how we refine them, how we get better at them. Um, and I think we should be uh, fairly upfront about that. So in terms of your question about the, uh, the Women's uh, Budget Group, um, as a government, we are very keen to work with them and to uh, understand from them how they think we can make things even stronger and even more rigorous in the future. OK, thank you. And my last question is, again, the Women's Budget Group identified a number of areas where they do have concerns about the Scottish budget, such as value in the care economy, childcare and the council tax freeze. They directly challenged the assertion in the budget equality statement that there is parity in the council tax freeze, and they don't accept that it actually helps people in low incomes because of cuts to council services. I'm not clear if they oppose the council tax freeze outright or if they simply believe it's underfunded. However, I wonder if you would agree with their call for a gender analysis of the council tax freeze and would you extend the gender analysis to any replacement for the council tax? Well, as uh, Margaret... Well, uh, firstly, I think drawing on my earlier comments about the Women's Budget Group and its importance, of course, we should consider any... Uh, suggestion they make about how we can better understand and measure and monitor the impact of our policies. So without going into any specifics there, we will have that uh, very uh, general uh, sympathetic approach to anything that they uh, might want to suggest in terms of how we, we do things. Um, in terms of uh, the council tax freeze, you know, the, the evidence shows that in terms of uh, those at the, the bottom end of the income scale, uh, then they uh, benefit to the tune of a larger percentage of their income from the council tax freeze than those at the top end uh, of, of the income scale. Uh, but, you know, as Margaret McCulloch is already aware, and it's another uh, commitment that we're taking forward from the programme for government, uh, preparations are underway uh, in terms of the establishment of the commission cross-party well, with one exception, cross-party commission uh, that will look at uh, the replacement for the current system uh, or our replacement for the current system of council tax. So I would expect many of these issues that Margaret McCulloch is raising uh, to be considered as part of that process. In terms of some of the other policies uh, that were mentioned, childcare, um, I am very firmly of the view uh, that the expansion of childcare that we've seen uh, thus far under this government, the increase to 600 hours, which is a 45% increase in the number of hours children uh, are entitled to, and the further plans we have, if we're re-elected over the lifetime of the next parliament, to almost double the provision of childcare, is a policy that has significant benefits, first and foremost for children, but equally significant benefits for uh, parents and, in particular, mothers who are seeking to get back into work or to pursue careers. So, you know, that is an example, in my view, of a policy that is very specifically uh, drawn from our desire to have greater equality running through our policies and our budget decisions. Thank you. Thank you. Bruce Crawford, the Devolution for the Powers Committee. Yep. Uh, thank you, First Minister. Um, obviously, we now have the draft clauses um, produced by the UK Government, First Minister, and the command paper. And since that date, there have been developments relating to intergovernmental working on finance matters. Uh, they start the work on the fiscal framework, on the establishment of a new joint ministerial group on welfare. And my committee has also received correspondence from the Secretary of State. The discussions are ongoing between the two governments and between the UK government and party leaders on issues such as devolution um, of student visas, health and safety law, and possibly abortion. I wonder, can the First Minister update us on where our, our, what our government's understanding of where these discussions, where they're progressing, how they're progressing, and where they might lead? Um, yes, I, I can. I'll, I'll do that. And then if there are particular aspects of it that uh, you want me to get into further detail on, I'd be happy to do that. The new Joint Ministerial Group on Welfare, uh, for example, met for the first time in London uh, last week, and John Swinney and Alec Neal were in attendance at that. Uh, more, more generally, when the draft clauses were published, uh, the Scottish Government made clear, and you know, I'll make clear again today, that our aim was to develop 
or help to develop a bill that commands broad support and that can be ready for introduction as soon as is practically possible after the UK general election. And that very much remains the objective that we are working towards. Uh, we are in uh, discussion with the UK government. We've already provided comments on all of the uh, sections, and that includes, as you would expect, some very technical, detailed comments as well. Uh, we've already identified to Parliament areas where we want clauses to be improved, and the Deputy First Minister included some of this detail in the statement he gave to Parliament uh, a couple of weeks ago. Uh, so, for example, we want to see the need for the Scottish Government to obtain the consent of UK ministers on key areas, particularly around welfare, to be removed from the clauses. Uh, we want to see a move back to what uh, the Smith Commission proposed in terms of the power of the Scottish Parliament to create new benefits in devolved areas and to supplement benefits in reserved areas. Uh, we would like to see the removal of uh, some of the restrictions around employability programmes uh, and there are a number of other areas that we want to explore with the UK government. You know, for example, the, the arrangements around the Crown Estate are very complex and we need to be sure that what the Parliament is getting is legislative competence out to 200 nautical miles, and there was some doubt previously expressed about that. Uh, provision in tribunals, for example, uh, doesn't devolve any new powers, um, and you know, there are some other areas where stakeholders uh, have already expressed doubts about the effectiveness of draft clauses and fixed odds. Betting terminals are one of those examples. So we are, uh, although we take a very different view, obviously, to the UK government on the extent and the scale of powers that we want this parliament to have. Nevertheless, we are uh, determined to work constructively um, with the UK government to improve the clauses and to get a bill that's fit for purpose to be introduced as soon as possible. Um, and as we go uh, along that road, there are a number of non-legislative areas, uh, post-study student visas, for example, we will try to progress in parallel as well. Inevitably, inevitably, there needs to be a space for intergovernmental discussion, um, and, and some of that space, certainly in the early days, will obviously have to be confidential as people are discussing these sort of issues. But there, there are obviously discussions ongoing between the two governments and directly, obviously, with political parties. But my interest in this is about how, what assurance the, the First Minister can give us about how the Parliament, particularly the committee which I'm responsible for, can be kept up to date about what's going on and you know, can she give any commitments about how her own government and the UK government can find appropriate mechanisms to, for the Scottish Parliament and the various interested committees of this Parliament to keep, to keep informed, obviously respecting that space that's there for intergovernment dialogue to take place. Well, I I uh, agree, well, I feel very strongly that uh, Parliament has to be central to this process. Uh, by that, I mean the Scottish Parliament, obviously the UK government, uh, uh, the UK Parliament will be central to it as well. But I think the need for uh, scrutiny in this Parliament by relevant committees and by Parliament as a whole is extremely important. And the Scottish Government will seek to facilitate that as uh, much as we possibly can. Deputy First Minister has already given evidence to your own committee, Mr Crawford, and to the Finance Committee. And we will, you know, we do stand ready and we'll continue to try to provide the committees with as much information as we can as this progress uh, process develops to enable the committees to do their job in as uh, full a way as possible. I mean, obviously, although I spoke earlier on about uh, the fact that a bill will not be introduced until after the UK general election, and you know, depending on the result of the UK election, there may be further negotiation that further refines some of what we are talking about. But there's absolutely nothing standing in the way of pre-legislative scrutiny, and I know your own committee is already uh, planning to, to do that and to you know make sure that stakeholders' views are heard and both governments get the opportunity to be held to account as well. Once the bill is introduced, then it will be subject through the LCM uh, procedure to full scrutiny in this Parliament, both by committees and by the full Parliament, as was the case around the 2012 Scotland Act. I think the final point I would make, and again we may come on to this in uh, the context of some of the uh, other committees' lines of questioning, but although the, the legislative uh, proposals here in the form of the bill that will be introduced are extremely important, uh, so too is the fiscal framework that will accompany uh, the legislation. Um, 
uh, in fact, in many ways, the, the fiscal framework may be uh, even more important in terms of getting the detail of that right. So what I would uh, suggest, and again, make it very clear that the government will be as helpful as possible in enabling the committees to do this job, is that scrutiny of the fiscal framework is as important as scrutiny of the legislation. Uh, in, in, that, in that regard, obviously, the Barnett formula and how it works is in, in, of incredible significance as far as the fiscal framework is concerned. I have yet to have an academic before our committee to tell us how we could actually explain how the Barnett formula works. Do you think it would be helpful in that regard if both parliaments could be much more aware of the intricacies of the Barnett formula and its adjustments so that we can all, whichever committee we are involved in, can be much more in tune with what is going on in that regard? as we begin to develop that very important fiscal framework? Um, I, I would strongly uh, suggest that that's a good idea. I mean, the, some of the legislative proposals and the discussion around the non-legislative aspects of this are very technical and, and very complex. I think that is uh, you know, even more the case when we get into the nitty-gritty of the, the fiscal framework. We know, uh, as government, from our experience over the block grant discussions around the block grant adjustment for the two taxes that will be uh, devolved from the 1st of April this year that these can be incredibly complex and at times vexed discussions and as well as uh, the committees of this parliament having a job to do a uh, big job to do principal job to hold uh, my government to account in the decisions we take in the areas uh, we negotiate around these things i think there is a job for the committees to do just to shine a light on what can otherwise be you know, very uh, complicated and technical uh, detail here. And I think the more the committees can help to perform that task, then the more likely it is we will get to an arrangement uh, around the fiscal framework uh, that is in the, the interests of this parliament and the interests of the people we serve. Michael McMahon, the Welfare Reform Committee, Kofina. Thanks very much, uh, President Officer. Um, First Minister, you referred to the programme for government and the announcements that you made. In that, one of those announcements was to have an advisor on poverty and inequality, which was, uh, I think, a very welcome uh, step forward. Can you give us an idea of what progress has been made in relation to that and anything specific that the advisor has identified which you want to take forward in the early course? Um, I am hoping to announce an appointment of the independent advisor, I would hope, before the end of March. Um, I have been engaged in discussions over the past couple of weeks uh, with a, a possible uh, candidate uh, um, for, for reasons that I hope Michael McMahon will understand. We're not yet at the point of uh, agreeing an appointment. I'm not able to uh, say yet uh, who that candidate might be, but uh, those discussions have been positive and I'm hopeful of making an announcement, as I say, within that time frame. Uh, I am absolutely firm and, uh, you know, we'll, be making this clear again when we announce uh, who the independent advisor is going to be, that this will be a genuinely independent uh, appointment. Uh, somebody whose role it will be to advise the Scottish Government on uh, the additional policies that we could consider to make a bigger impact in reducing poverty but also somebody who has a free hand in looking at our current policies and advising us on where we're not going far enough or where current policies may be, uh, in the opinion of the advisor, uh, frustrating our efforts to reduce poverty. Uh, so it's, uh, and it's you know, a role that I would see having not just a, a function of producing an annual report, although it might do that, but much more of an ongoing uh, oversight of the government's programme so that we, almost in real time, have a, a deeper understanding of uh, the impact of our policy uh, on the objective we've set to, to reduce poverty. Um, now, at times, uh, having somebody in a role like that uh, will be uncomfortable for government, and I'm sure you know, will be times when it's uncomfortable for me as, as First Minister. That's the whole point of it. Um, so it's an appointment that I think, together with the other uh, initiatives we're taking to reduce poverty and close the uh, inequality gap, I think can make a, a big difference. And I'm extremely uh, enthusiastic about it and looking forward to the point at which we can uh, appoint that person and allow them to go on with their work. Okay, uh, thanks very much for that. Um, in relation to some of the things that, that we know the Scottish Government uh, are doing you know, really good work in terms of mitigating uh, the impact of, of the welfare reforms. Um, but one of the things that is currently in front of our committee is the, the welfare funds bill. 
the third sector have indicated their disappointment at the failure to currently have the, the government signed up to ensuring that those are, who are impacted in terms of poverty and who are having to rely on the Scottish Welfare Fund to have their dignity enshrined in principle in the bill and also when it comes to decisions of local authorities to support people, uh, whether that should be done in kind or in cash, that there is a, res a reluctance to give choice to people. You know, there, there is a sense that um, just because someone is in poverty and is, and is asking for support from the state that they should not have a choice. Can you explain to us why you are not yet in a position to support the, the principle of dignity and the principle of choice? Well, I, I do support the principle of, of dignity and I know one of the debates that has uh, you know, been there since the uh, establishment of the Scottish Welfare Fund and has run through the consideration of uh, the bill to some extent is the debate around uh, whether support for people should be in cash or in kind. And you know, I've been very firm that that should be a, a decision that is driven by the needs of, of the person, uh, first and foremost. So the bill obviously hasn't completed its parliamentary process yet, and we will continue to listen and to respond as positively as we can. Um, I, I hope anybody, and as you know, I used to have responsibility for this policy area before uh, becoming First Minister and appeared before your committee on many occasions to talk about these things. You know, there is an absolute desire here to see the welfare fund give as much help as possible to people who are living in very vulnerable circumstances and being impacted by welfare reform. Some of the issues, and I'm not uh, suggesting that it necessarily includes all of the issues that you're raising here in the context of the bill, but some of the issues which you frequently get uh, in legislative scrutiny uh, come down to a debate about whether some of the detail is best on the face of the bill as opposed to being in guidance that will support the implementation of the bill. Uh, there will be uh, a suite of guidance that supports the implementation of this bill and third sector organisations will obviously have a part to play as we put together that guidance. So there will be a, a number of issues where the government may take the view that a, a particular issue is best dealt with in the supporting guidance as opposed to on the face of the bill. But we still got a stage of the bill to go and I certainly you know, will make very clear that we will listen uh, to the, the points that are being put forward by third sector organisations as we take final decisions. Okay, that's very welcome. One final short yeah, question. Briefly, thank you. Um, and, uh, following on from Bruce Crawford's line of questions, obviously the Welfare Reform Committee is going to take a keen interest in the, the, the powers that are going to be devolved. Can you give us an indication of what type of change or, or specific change that you want to see when the, you're given the powers via the new uh, settlement? Well, some of uh, the things I uh, would like to do around universal credit, for example, and you know, one of the issues that we have to wait and see to what extent it translates into actual devolution of power is how much flexibility we're going to have around universal credit. But I want to get rid of the bedroom tax. I would like to be able to vary the frequency of payments to uh, make sure that we can... Uh, direct payments to the person in the household that is most in need of them as opposed to being one person which we've you know debated many times before often makes women and children in a household particularly vulnerable i would like to have the option in universal credit to pay uh, the the housing element direct to landlords where you know if somebody is in a particularly vulnerable situation um Carers' allowance, um, I have made clear in the past that I think it is completely wrong that carers' allowance is set at the lowest level of any uh, benefit of its kind. And I would like to see this parliament be in a position to increase carers' allowance and give carers who do such a fantastic job um, a much better deal. Some of the areas where... Um, no, I'd make two points about the ability of the parliament to uh, establish additional benefits or top up existing benefits is where the draft clauses simply do not appear to give us the power that Smith proposed us to have. And I think what we've got to do is make sure that we get back to what Smith was proposing. The Parliament will have, uh, I, I'm sure if it does get these powers, will have many debates about you know, the, the ability to top up or create additional benefits. Um, you know, where we have power already, for example, we've taken different decisions on things like the educational maintenance allowance, and so options like that will open up. One of them, to, to finish on a more general point, you know, as, as we go down the road of more devolution, and you know, 
we know are differing opinions on where that journey should end. But the Parliament has to be very mindful of uh, making sure there is an appropriate balance between its ability to spend money and its abil ability to raise revenue. Um, and I think that's one of the, the general points that we'll want to keep in mind as we go further down this road. Christine Graham, Justice Committee, Kavina. Thank you very much, uh, Presiding Officer. I think I'm going to have another wee moan like last year. I'm sure, First Minister, oh, you, don't, you'll not be surprised. You have familiarised yourself with the issues raised on behalf of the Justice Committee at the first of these meetings. Then I drew attention to the stream of legislation and training ahead. And I feel as a result of my comments, nothing has changed. And frankly, now that legislative programme has been announced, nothing can change. Uh, currently, we're dealing with prisoners' control of release bill, stage one, human trafficking and exploitation bill, starting stage one, criminal justice bill coming back to us in September ahead, fatal accidents inquiry, community justice bill, pro probably Michael McMahon's bill on uh, criminal verdicts, and possibly Margaret Mitchell's uh, apologies bill. Now, I understand government's like right to put forward legislation. Of course, they all have done. But I complain then, and this is on behalf of the committee, that the level of legislation leaves no time none whatsoever for post-legislative scrutiny and hardly any time for a brief inquiry. And I would also say that when you've got so many bills in the air, it makes scrutinising very difficult to do it effectively when they're dealing with very different issues. Can I ask if consideration can be given to the impact on the legislative workload of the Justice Committee? And I, I, I don't want to see two Justice Committees. And I don't want to see the Bureau assigning bills to other committees because we've got too much. But would it be possible for, because we should be holding the Cabinet Secretary to account, is it possible for the government, prior to publicising legislation, to give consideration to discussing with appropriate conveners, not the substance, but the volume of legislation, so that we can return to our dual role of a standing and a select committee? Because my concern is, A, we're not given time to really look properly at legislation, which is nobody's fault, but is, must be, in my view, correct in the committee. And also, we've completely lost the ability to be a, a select committee and give inquiries. Um, I know Christine Graham had raised this issue previously, and you know, I'm, I'm not unsympathetic to the, uh, the case that, that she makes. The, the government does take account, when it's drawn up its legislative programme, it, it does take account of the relative workloads of, of different committees. Um, and uh, I see a former Minister for Parliamentary Business nodding um, beside you there. Um, it's also the case that the Minister for Parliamentary Business is always available to discuss ongoing issues of scheduling and uh, workload of, of committees. And I would encourage any convener that uh, feels there is an issue around its committee workload to, to take up uh, that opportunity. I'm more than happy uh, to look at how we, in advance of publishing our legislative programme, engage with committee conveners to have a discussion about uh, the, the balance of bills and what that means for the workload of, of different committees. I, I'm sure Christine Graham, though, in return, will understand that you know, there is ov often very good reasons for the government's legislative programme in particular having the shape that it does, because there will be particular issues that require to be dealt with. And, uh, but nevertheless, I, I understand uh, the point that the convener is making. I think my final point here, though, would be, and I'm not just trying to curry favour with uh, Christine Graham, uh, although that's never a bad idea, in, in my humble opinion, uh, but the Justice Committee is a good example, in my view, of a, a committee that has had a heavy legislative workload in, in many of the years of this Parliament, but has nevertheless retained a very high level of scrutiny, both of the legislation and of the government in general. Believe me, as a, a government minister, as Deputy First Minister over the past uh, seven years, and now as First Minister, I've never really felt that the government's had an easy uh, ride from the Justice Committee of, of the Parliament. So um, I think the committee does do its job well, but I, I hear what Christine Graham is saying. May I just say, well, thank you very much for at least giving consideration to um, discussing with a convener, it might not be for all conveners here, but certainly with the heavy workload and legislation with the Justice Committee in advance so that we do justice, combine justice uh, to the legislation ahead of us. But there is, again, the issue of the balance that may not be for other committees of our role of standing and select. And I have to say that in my early years of Justice Committee here, we had opportunities, for instance, to question the Chief Inspector of Prisons on his report. We never get that now. And it seems over the 15 years 
uh, for the Com Justice Committee that's been eroded and eroded and eroded. So in the mix is this role of the committee within the Scottish Parliament, not simply as a standing committee to scrutinise legislation. I, and I, I hope the, I'm sure the First Minister will give that consideration. I'm carrying favour with you now. The issues that Christian Graham's raising are actually matters much more for the Parliament um, than for the government itself. Um, Ms Graham will also know that I am in dialogue both with the conveners um, and the business managers of this Parliament about how our committees can be more effective, and that includes workload. And can I also say to Ms Graham that it is, of course, open to any convener of any committee to make up an approach to the Bureau and the business managers about their workload, and I'm quite sure they would find a sympathetic hearing. Um, Jim Eady. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Good afternoon, First Minister. Uh, my question relates to the proposed private rented sector housing bill. Uh, although this bill does not feature in the current legislative programme, I understand it is expected to be introduced in the autumn. The Scottish Government's consultation on the reform of the private sector tenancy regime proposed that the no-fault ground for repossession be removed. This is where landlords can reclaim their property because the fixed term has ended. And clearly there will be a range of views um, expressed during the consultation on this issue. My question to you is, there will always be tensions and competing issues between the rights of the tenant and the landlord, um, but the overarching aim of the proposed new tenancy is to improve security of tenure for tenants while providing appropriate safeguards for landlords, lenders and investors. How confident are you that the legislation, when it is published, will strike the right balance? Well, our uh, very firm aim will be to get that balance right, and as, uh, as you rightly say, there will always be tensions uh, between the interests of tenants and those of landlords or investors in private sector housing. Um, the bill, private sector tenancy bill, is intended for inclusion in our next programme for government, but will, is scheduled for introduction at a very early stage of, of the following year, so uh, round about the autumn of this year. Uh, we're still in the process of analysing the consultation on this bill. We've had uh, over 2,500 responses to the consultation. On the issue of removing the no-fault uh, ground of uh, a landlord regaining possession of, of a property, uh, somewhere in the region of 80% of uh, the consultation responses that expressed a view on that have been in favour of removing that ground. But you're right to say that uh, the majority of industry bodies, landlords, letting agents uh, didn't agree with that and their view is that it could act as a barrier to future investment or result in current investment in private sector uh, rented housing being withdrawn. So clearly we've got to listen very carefully to that. Final point I would say, and you know, because we're still in the uh, midst of uh, analysing the consultation. We have not taken a final decision on the content of the Bill on this issue or on any other issue yet. But if we do proceed with removing the no-fault ground for repossession, which, as you say, is simply um, allowing a landlord to uh, repossess when a tenancy reaches its end date, we will replace that with very clearly defined grounds on which a landlord can uh, take repossession of of a tenancy, uh, so that there is clarity around when that can happen. And you know, many landlords will cite circumstances such as if they want to sell the property, then they need to have a, an ability to, to get possession uh, back. So we're listening to these things very carefully. There's a very strong view uh, that a key part of tenancy reform would be removing that you know, very blanket no-fault ground and replacing it with more defined grounds, but we'll uh, come to a final decision when we've properly analysed the consultation. OK, that, that, I think we'll leave it at that on that issue for the moment. Can I ask you about another issue? The consultation also asked for views on the, what action the Scottish Government should take on rent levels and what rent review conditions the new tenancy regime should include. Can I ask you to outline, albeit within... Uh, the confines of uh, tight time uh, strictures. What will be the factors governing the development of the government's approach as it seeks to enshrine and embed concrete proposals in the housing bill? I mean, the factors that will uh, determine our view on, on this are perhaps not identical, but similar to the kind of factors we've been talking about in uh, relation to the previous issue. Uh, we've got to do two things with the private rented housing sector. We've got to firstly make sure it's affordable 
and of a high quality. And you know, I represent a constituency in Glasgow where there are significant issues with the private rented sector. And you know, these issues, I think, have to be able to be more effectively dealt with. But on the other side, we need to, uh, because more and more people are reliant on the private rented uh, part of the market, we need to make sure that we're, it is an attractive uh, proposition for investors and for landlords. We don't want to end up having a constrained supply of, of private rented sector housing. So we have to balance these things. Um, there's been discussion in the context of previous legislation about uh, the arguments for caps on rents or you know, a, a restriction in terms of the increases in rent. And you know, given the cost of housing for uh, some people in the private rented sector, I'm certainly uh, not blind to the, the merits of that argument, which is why we've specifically put it into the consultation. But you know, similarly, it's uh, I guess uh, my conclusion on this is similar to my uh, conclusion on the, the last uh, issue. We need to properly analyse the consultation before we uh, can come to a final judgement on what would be appropriate to include in the bill. Okay, thank you. Duncan McNeill, the Health and Support Committee convener. Thanks, President Officer. Um, First Minister, could I say from a personal point of view that I welcome uh, your uh, willingness to you know, have more regular um, meetings with the conveners group. Um, I think we need to work out, of course, how we do that in a meaningful way with 16 people around about the table. But uh, I, I think it is welcome. And while I'm, while I'm on this welcoming uh, um, uh, mood, I can also welcome uh, the, your announcement yesterday in regards to uh, NHS transparency. I think that will be certainly useful to the, to the health committee as well as members of the public uh, and indeed um, uh, the, the work of the health committee. Could, could I ask a, a short question following that though and, and, and will you be making all of the, the, the data that you receive from health boards uh, at the health department uh, available? Uh, all of the health board information you receive on a weekly basis, will that be made available and we put on the website? If not, what will not be reported? E &E. I'm talking or about generally. I'm talking about generally in terms mm -hmm. of your announcement of uh, transparency <laughs> yesterday to share as much information as possible. You know, we know that there's mm -hmm. a wide range of information that comes from the health boards on a weekly basis. Will that information be published uh, on, on the proposed website and uh, made public? What I want to do is, is two things here, and they're obviously related. I want as much information about the performance of the health service to be available publicly uh, and for that to be available as regularly as appropriate, because there will be some measurements of performance that you know, would not be particularly meaningful to publish on a, a weekly basis. For example, uh, the uh, performance around the treatment time guarantee, because that is, you know, assessed over a 12-week period. So, you know, you have to judge the appropriateness of the frequency depending on the particular circumstances. So that's the first thing I want to do. Uh, but secondly, we want to make sure that the information that is being made available publicly is being made available in a way that is meaningful, not just to be perfectly frank about it, to MSPs and to parliamentary committees, although that is important, but parliamentary committees are well uh, versed in you know, delving into the kind of technically produced information that uh, is already available. I want members of the public to be able to, in a very easy way, go onto a website and themselves look at how the health service is performing in their area, you know, where appropriate in the hospital that they uh, may be referred to. So that's what we're trying to achieve. Now, in terms of what I think you're getting at here, the, the health department, as you would expect, and you would uh, be, I'm sure, concerned if this wasn't the case, monitors the performance of the health service on a very regular basis. Again, you know, the, the degree and the frequency of that depends on the particular aspect of performance that we're looking at. So the health department will have you know, a variety of information on a management basis all of the time. But as you are equally aware, what gets published in terms of validated official statistics is a decision for statisticians, not for politicians. And sometimes politicians can get into trouble if they publish you know, unvalidated management information. So it will be down to the statisticians in, in terms of what is published as official statistics. But I am very clear that I want, you know, I, I, I think our health service, notwithstanding the challenges that we routinely will see, 
in the winter around A&E or you know, around other pressures that our health service faces, our health service performs extremely well. Uh, extremely well. And therefore, I want as much of the information around that to be available routinely and in an easily accessible way. President officer, I wasn't expecting as long an answer as that as I got. I mean, you know, a bit longer yes, to ask a question, thank you, thank Mr McNeil. You, because I, I need to move on. Although, can I take from that long answer that it's, not a, it's a question of practicality, uh, frequency, but not principle, that the information that the Scottish Government gets will be available to the committees of this Parliament and be, and through that process, available to the public. Oh, oh, sub subject to, it is for statisticians to assess whether information can be published well, as official yeah, sta yeah, statistics. Yeah. Uh, if there's particular... Probably need to be pursued. Uh, I'll, I'll be brief, President Officer. I know Ms McNeill wants to go on to another issue, but this is a genuine offer. If there are particular... Uh, aspects of performance that your committee would be particularly interested in or, or to know how we intend to approach it in terms of publication, I'd be happy to enter into that discussion with you. Also, uh, and again, I was a regular attender in front of the Health Committee when I was Health Secretary, the committee can you know, have a Cabinet Secretary in front of them at any time to delve into the detail uh, of the statistics or the information that the Health Department has on the Health Service. Thanks. Right, very, very quickly then. Okay. In, in terms of the programme for government, you know, I think, uh, again, welcome that it recognises the, the need for transformational change in how we deliver our, our, our health and care. Uh, and the, the Health Committee, um, uh, as you know, First Minister, uh, shares that, that, that ambition. Uh, but the change has been slow. Demand uh, grows. We have significant pressures uh, in the acute sector. We've got tight budgets in local government and health, who, which is, you know, they need to work together to deliver this change. As the 2020 vision and all it entails, a seven-day care, uh, uh, achievable within those timescales uh, that have been laid out by the government without additional transformational funding to make that happen? Well, we are committed to the 2020 vision and Shona Robinson has shared with Parliament uh, in uh, very recent weeks uh, her uh, approach to taking that forward and involving uh, Parliament and the public in the discussions about how we uh, equip the health service to face up to the changes that we know are happening in society, particularly around the demographic changes. Um, the health service budget is at record levels. It's increased in cash terms by £3 billion since this government took office. It's gone over £12 billion for the first time ever. And that's against the backdrop of a Scottish government budget that's reduced in real terms by 10%. So, you know, we'd all like to be in the position of being able to give even more money to the health service or to local authorities or to any other uh, area of our budget, but we operate within a fixed budget. And in that context, we have protected the revenue budget of the health service. We have also uh, ensured that we are resourcing what is perhaps the biggest reform of how we deliver health and social care since the health service was established. Uh, and we're the first government to have you know, finally got on and done this, which is the integration of health and social care, which is a massive uh, reform of how we uh, deliver these services, which will make a big difference in terms of the, the user of, of those services. Um, and we will continue to work through uh, the longer term plans in terms of reshaping the health service to take account of changing circumstances as collaboratively as we can. So the short answer to your question is, is yes. I'm not saying these things are not challenging, uh, but we are committed to the 2020 vision and to making the changes to our health service that are required. Without transitional funding? Well, but if you look at integration uh, of health and social care, for example, we have funded specifically uh, that on that basis. If you look at when I was health secretary, we had transitional, transformational funding around uh, older people's care to kind of prime, pr pump the uh, issues around integration. We do similarly on early years funding. So we do seek out of a twelve billion pound budget. You know, we're, we're all. We're all on board for this transformation. Can we make it happen without additional transitional funding within the timescale of 2020? We going, is it going to be 2025 whole... or is it going to be 2020? No, we're working to the timescales and the budgets we've set out, but 
you know, 170 million, it has to, it's, it's the whole health budget and the whole social care budget that we're trying to join up here to better. So it's not a case of it's 170 million for the integration of health and social care. That's additional funding to try to ease that transition. But what we need to do is make sure that the entirety of the health budget is being spent effectively to manage that demographic change that we're dealing with. I'm sorry, well, Duncan, we're going to have to, Duncan, we're going to have to, Duncan, we're going to have to move on. Stuart Maxwell, Convener Education Culture Committee. Thank you very much, um, Presiding Officer. Um, First Minister, um, you've made, obviously, um, some announcements recently on the um, Government's intention to tackle the link between uh, socio-economic deprivation and attainment. Um, um, the Education Secretary was at the Education Committee um, at the beginning of February, and I want to quote, she said, as the Committee knows, we plan to introduce an education bill to the Parliament in March and I want to ensure that it contains measures to address the attainment gap and promote equity for all our children. Um, can you just maybe lay out um, in some detail what the intention of the government's programme is in relation to this particular area? You've obviously made announcements in terms of the fund, in terms of the attainment fund, but I just wondered what action you intend to take through legislation which will back up that fund. Well, the, the Education Bill is, is, has not yet been introduced yet, so you know, obviously um, Parliament will uh, have that introduced to it in the normal course, but as well as the things that have already been talked about in terms of the education bill, we are looking uh, very closely at how we, through legislation, um, make or enable ourselves to make more progress in closing the attainment gap. And you know that is looking, for example, at, around the possibility of duties on local authority authorities as they take forward uh, their uh, decisions in education to you know have clear in their minds the, the obligation to be reducing that attainment gap. So we're looking at how we can use the education bill uh, to pursue and uh, progress that objective. But I think to be, while that's important, I would be hesitant uh, in suggesting that legislation alone is going to reduce the attainment gap, which is why we've put so much emphasis on some of the other measures that you allude to and that we've been talking about over uh, the past few weeks, the measures in the programme for government around uh, the new read -write count campaign, education uh, attainment advisors in every local authority area, and more recently, uh, the £100 million over the next four years attainment uh, fund to pursue an attainment challenge. And Education Secretary yesterday, of course, announced the local authorities that will initially be part of that fund. So legislation has got a, a role to play uh, and what we're looking at just now is how we use the vehicle of the Education Bill to make sure that role is maximised. But what we do around the legislation will be as, if not more, important. No, I, I very much agree mm -hmm. with that. And, um, but you mentioned the attainment advisor. Could you maybe, if it's at all possible, give us some detail exactly what an attainment advisor would, would do in, in each local authority? And with regard to your comment about the local authorities, um, it has been raised by uh, a member of my committee and... Uh, a member of the public with me, um, you, you've listed, or the, the government listed, the individual local authorities where the money will be allocated. Um, and I'm sure we're all very pleased about the fact that uh, we're tackling some of the most difficult areas in terms of deprivation first. But clearly, one of the questions that's been raised me, with me is that obviously deprivation doesn't just exist in those areas where there's generally wider deprivation. It exists in, in all parts of the country. And could you maybe explain to myself and others, um, thinking behind identifying it by a local authority uh, rather than by other measures of deprivation? Um, the first point to make, I suppose, is you're right. Uh, you can find uh, deprivation in areas that are seen overall as being affluent areas, and you can find classrooms that will have children from some of the more affluent uh, backgrounds and some of the most deprived backgrounds in the same classroom, which is why uh, much of what we're talking about around attainment is being talked about on a universal basis. So, you know, what I've spoken about around the Read Write count, count campaign, the attainment advisors, that's part of what we're describing as the, the universal offer. What we are determined to do is raise attainment overall. But in terms of the attainment challenge, what we're also recognising, and I, well, obviously I think we're right to recognise it, but 
you know, I think it's really important that we do is that there are some parts of the country, and the statistics in terms of exam passes, etc., bear this out, where there are particular, more uh, deeply ingrained challenges. And that's why, in terms of the additional funding, and this is the you know, funding additional to what we are, you know, have already been spending in terms of improving educational outcomes, will be focused initially on the seven local authority areas that the Education Secretary spoke about uh, yesterday. And these are the areas where there are the biggest concentrations of households in deprived areas. Now, the reason we set out uh, this over a four-year period, the additional, uh, the, sorry, the initial £20 million will be spent in the coming financial year, but it's a four-year plan uh, initially, is that, well, firstly, evidence from other similar schemes, the London Challenge has been cited, suggests you need to do this over a period of time. But secondly, because it, we would want to move uh, through other areas in the future um, as well. So it's about starting where the problem is biggest, but it's not in any sense saying that that's the only place that the problem exists. In terms of attainment advisors, which I think was your first question, uh, there's uh, some very intensive work ongoing with Education Scotland just now to uh, move to the implementation of the attainment advisor uh, a commitment. But attainment advisors, in uh, summary, will be uh, experts in their field who can, uh, as the name suggests, advise local authorities and schools and teachers on best practice in terms of raising attainment and be part of the process of sharing that learning and best practice uh, right across the country. But the Education Secretary will uh, have more to say about this uh, in the not too distant future. OK, thank you very much. Thank you. Model Fraser. Economy and Tourism. Uh, thank you. Good afternoon, uh, First Minister. I wonder if I could ask a couple of questions from the um, economy and business uh, perspective. There, there was a promise in the programme to introduce a new Scottish business pledge, which uh, is intended to reward, uh, in effect, good employers who, for example, pay the living wage um, by uh, bringing forward a package of tailored support. Um, I wonder if you can tell me what the, the timetable for bringing that in is. Uh, do we know what the budget for that is going to be? And I wonder if the Scottish Government uh, have looked at or will look at the idea of using um, the business rates regime to help reward and incentivise companies, mid-sized companies, that pay the living wage, because some direct financial assistance might well be beneficial in pushing them down that road. OK, in terms of, let me take those uh, two questions in turn. Um, in terms of the business pledge, I uh, spoke at the National Economic Forum in December um, and signalled then that we wanted to have um, a period of work with uh, businesses and with key stakeholders to develop uh, the model and then begin implementation. Uh, the work to develop the Scottish Business Pledge is ongoing. Um, my officials uh, just, for example, met the Federation of Small Businesses on uh, yesterday, in fact, 17th of February, and uh, I'll be meeting the Institute of Directors to discuss the pledge uh, very shortly. Um, so we're designing the detail of that at the moment. Uh, we've not set a date, a specific date yet, for the, the formal launch of the pledge, but it will be um, in the not-too-distant future uh, once we've uh, finalised the detail of it. Uh, the pledge will not be compulsory on businesses. It will be voluntary. Uh, initial dialogue suggests that there is a, a, a significant appetite around what it is we're trying to do here, which is effectively strike a partnership with business. Uh, what is the support principally through our enterprise agencies that we can provide businesses with? Uh, and what in return would we be looking for businesses to do, not just to help government with the social objectives we've set, but in recognition of the fact that businesses with um, you know, well-paid, well-motivated workforces tend to be more successful businesses. Uh, in parallel to this, of course, we've got the commitment for the Fair Work Convention, and again, there will be announcements fairly shortly on the, the, the membership and the establishment of the Fair Work Convention. In terms of the living wage, um, I, I'm... Very, I do take this as a, an absolute yes to your specific question, or even a, a, any kind of yes to your specific question at this stage. But generally speaking, I am uh, so 
so uh, keen to see the living wage extend as quickly as possible through our economy uh, that I'm willing to consider all suggestions of how we can accelerate progress. So I'm happy to consider uh, what you've, you've put forward there with uh, no commitments uh, at, at this stage. Um, I do recognise, and I think this is what you're getting at, that for some businesses, progress into the living wage will be much, much more difficult than it is for others. And that will be particularly true for some in the SME sector. Um, that said, progress towards the living wage is actually very impressive at the moment. Um, I uh, spoke in the programme for government, John Swinney spoke in his budget a bit more about uh, the living wage accreditation scheme. Uh, we set a target for the end of this year to get 150 businesses accredited as living wage employers. Uh, I can tell the committee today we're already at 120 um, and it's February. So, you know, that is going well, but we need to keep the momentum behind it for good, sound economic reasons, but for good, sound social reasons as well. Thank you. That's, that's a very mm -hmm. positive response. I wonder if I could ask a brief, a brief follow-up still on, on business rates. One of the proposals in the, uh, in the government's programme was to uh, remove the business rates exemption for shooting and deer stocking estates. Now, I had a meeting a few days ago with the Scottish Gamekeepers Association. We were very concerned about the impact this would have on employment of their members. And I wonder if the Scottish Government have done any uh, economic impact assessment of the likely impact on the rural economy and of employment if this were to be introduced. As we progress with the land reform legislation, then in the normal course of legislation, of course, we will do business impact assessment and that will be you know, available for uh, the relevant committee, probably your, well, maybe it won't be your committee, actually, maybe the Rural Affairs Committee, I don't know, uh, to scrutinise. Um, I you know, I said at the time the uh, business rates exemption for sporting estates, I think, was introduced by a, a former Conservative uh, government in 1994, to be precise. Um, you know, if, if you're, and I, I can understand that those who benefit from that exemption have concerns about the removal of that exemption. Equally, there will be many, many, many businesses in other sectors who will look at it and consider it unfair when they don't get an exemption from business rates. What we said is one of the reasons. Uh, for removing the exemption is to free up resources that we can then use to accelerate progress through our land fund towards the million acres uh, in community ownership by 2020. Um, so these are you know, ob objectives that we have set for good reasons, but you know, I'm determined as we progress our land reform agenda, not just this aspect of it, but all of it, uh, we work with the landowning uh, community uh, in order that you know, they can make their views known and that we can make very clear we're not, uh, you know, responsible landowners uh, are to be, uh, you know, celebrated in Scotland, not penalised, but there are significant issues around uh, the, the landowning uh, landscape, if that's uh, not uh, too much of a, a, a pun in Scotland, that need to be addressed, and that's what we're determined to try to do. The Convener of Rural Affairs, Climate Change and Environment Committee. Thank you, President Officer. Yeah, following on recognising that land reform is a central government policy objective and uh, thinking about the barriers that exist and the potential opportunities that there are from land reform, how do you see Holyrood uh, increasing the distribution of land ownership in Scotland among more families and more communities? Well, I've uh, referred in passing in answer to Murdo Fraser, of course, to our uh, commitment to have a million acres in community ownership by 2020. That's an important uh, part of the answer to your question. Uh, there's also a lot in what we're talking about around the land reform agenda that is related to greater transparency and information about land ownership, which I then think helps uh, the, the issue of diversification that you speak about. So we've committed to completion of the land uh, register within 10 years, which in and of itself will improve transparency. And uh, we're also uh, consulting on two other uh, particular proposals that would have a, an impact here, limiting the legal entities that can own land in Scotland and making available much more information about uh, land, the value of the land and ownership of the land. Uh, there's also some work, because obviously you know, we don't hold all of the levers in this area, and there's some uh, work at both Westminster and European Union level that may also be important in this context. About uh, the role of Westminster in this as the responsible authority for companies and trust law, 
Um, you, we've got lots of difficulties of identifying who actually owns Scotland, uh, crofting estates, uh, trying to have communities get a hold of who actually is their landlord. Uh, would you see uh, the revelation of uh, beneficial owners as a, something that would be a great help to the land reform process? And do you think that Westminster would be prepared to play uh, ball on that? Well, there is uh, some... Uh, developments at, at both Westminster and European level that uh, I think are intended to make progress in this area and we'll support them if we think they are robust enough. So, you know, for example, the, the fourth money laundering directive, uh, part of that will require all member states to maintain ultimate beneficial ownership registers, both for uh, corporate entities and for trusts. Um, and uh, there's also... Uh, some uh, developments at UK government uh, level uh, around issues of transparency and trust in, in companies, which are partly about combating uh, fraud and tax evasion uh, and money laundering. Uh, but uh, the Small Business uh, Enterprise and Employment Bill uh, was introduced in June uh, to Westminster in June last year, which has a bearing uh, on all of these. So, in, in short, there's various uh, initiatives underway. Obviously, what I'm most uh, concerned about is how we use our land reform legislation to strike the right balance um, on many of these issues. What I laid out in the programme for government is, uh, you know, I think it's taken us forward. Uh, one of the first acts this parliament to uh, pass was land reform legislation. Um, and I think there is a consensus, although I appreciate not everybody agrees with all aspects of it, there is a consensus that it's time to move forward in some of these things. And that's what we're determined to do. Just very, very briefly, um, is there a sense that the UK government is prepared to reveal uh, who are the members and the beneficial owners of trusts as well as companies? Um, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure I can answer that definitively. I think you'd probably have to ask the, the UK government. There are, as I've set out, I think there are some developments in the law uh, at both Westminster and European Union level that would, uh, if they are implemented, taken forward and implemented, would be helpful in the sense of, of doing that. Whether there is a political will to do that, um, I, I guess you would have to ask UK government ministers. I'm not sure I can speak for them in that respect. Thank you. Christina McKelvey. Thank you very much, uh, President Officer. Um, good afternoon, First Minister. Um, a couple of things that are vexing my committee right now, two very, very hot topics that are on the agenda and, and, and possibly will come to a head tomorrow when we have Lord Livingston in front of the committee is the Transatlantic Trade and Investment Partnership. And a big aspect of um, the, the inquiry that we have undertaken is the perceived lack of transparency and how the public outcry on that pushed um, a Commissioner Maelstrom to, to change that and, and to make it much, much more transparent. Um, the other big issue within that, and it's, it, it, both things are related, is on the impact on public services and especially on our health service in Scotland. So what, what I was um, looking to ask you was um, if you could give us any update on the progress of the discussions between the UK government, the Scottish government and the, the EU um, on um, how we ensure that the reservations that have to be made within the Transatlantic Trade and Investment Partnership are made to protect public services in Scotland. Well, firstly, on transparency, I think the more transparency there can be around this, the better. And I appreciate negotiations, any negotiation by its very nature, not all of all aspects of the negotiation can be done in public. Uh, but nevertheless, I think it would be helpful in this process if there was more rather than less transparency. You know, I'm, as all of us often are asked, do you agree with T TTIP or not? The truth is, none of us can say that definitively because we don't know what's going to finally be in TTIP. In terms of the point about public services, I mean, our, I know uh, John Swinney was before your committee a couple of weeks ago. I mean, our view on public services and the NHS in particular is, is very clear and has been uh, communicated to both the UK government and the European Commission very, very uh, forcibly. Uh, we think there should be an express, explicit exclusion on the face of any treaty for uh, public services and for the National Health Service. Now, you know, we've had uh, responses from both the UK government and the European Commission on the issue of the health service that, and I'm paraphrasing here, this is not a direct quote, that say, don't worry, there's nothing to, uh, to see here, it'll all be fine. Now, that may be the case, but I'm frankly not prepared to 
uh, assume that will be the case until we see uh, the letter of the law. And you know, I think the easiest way to put this beyond any doubt is to say that there should be that express exclusion uh, for public services generally, I would say, but particularly for the National Health Service. First Minister, I, I appreciate that and appreciate the, the openness in which your government has, has um, engaged with my committee on uh, that very topic. Um, and I hate to spring this on you, but we all got a, an email in our inbox this morning from Unite the Union, um, who are suggesting that the NHS is included in the material scope of TTIP. Um, and they seem to suggest they've got some legal advice on that. Um, I'm just wondering whether you know, that is something that the Scottish Government should be making a new approach to the UK Government on the basis that there is maybe some dubiety about whether it is part of the material scope of the, of, of the agreement or not. Um, I have seen uh, the Unite press release from this morning. Um, I, in uh, common with uh, other party leaders, have uh, signed the Unite pledge uh, calling expressly for an NHS exclusion uh, from TTIP. Um, I haven't seen the Unite legal advice, um, but my, my view is, is clear. I, I think, you know, and, and this is where I guess there is a, an additional concern for Scotland because we have, and I don't want to get sidetracked down uh, the, the, this road, but we have a situation where in England the health service has been substantially opened up to private competition. Uh, that's not the case in Scotland. And as well as a general concern about TTIP opening up public services, we have the additional concern that if it was, and I should again, for, in the interest of, of clarity, say the UK government say this is not the case, but if it was the case that because the health service in England has been opened up, then TTIP would have a bearing and somehow uh, we would be dragged into that, then you know, I think we need you know, almost two assurances. We need the general exclusion from TTIP, but we also need the assurance from the UK government that notwithstanding anything that TTIP might mean for its health service in England, there would be absolutely no circumstances in which the ability of this government to protect our health service from privatisation would be compromised in any way. I think... I'm sorry, we're going to have to move on. Uh, Kenneth this, uh, a wee bit early, but I wonder if you can provide an update on the timetable for negotiations in terms of Scotland's fiscal framework, and also uh, how should intergovernmental machinery, including the Joint Exchequer Committee, be strengthened and made more transparent? Um, in terms of the timetable, uh, the UK Command Paper, of course, uh, itself said that a fiscal framework should be agreed alongside the introduction of the legislation uh, in the next UK Parliament. And I, I know the Chief Secretary to the Treasury was before the Finance Committee recently, and he said he expected the fiscal framework to be agreed at the same time as the bill is advanced through the House of Commons. Um, I certainly uh, would be of the view that uh, the fiscal framework should be agreed before the legislation is enacted. Um, and I think we should be looking uh, at making sure that we've got agreement around the fiscal framework before this parliament is asked to give legislative consent through the LCM process, uh, which you know, would mean, uh, assuming the broad timescales for this remain on track, that we would have to be in a position to agree that before March 2016. Um, obviously, there's been a lot of engagement over the implementation of the 2012 Act uh, provisions with the Finance Committee and with the Public Audit Committee and in the, uh, the context of the fiscal framework, I would be very, very uh, keen to see uh, similar scrutiny and, in fact, enhanced scrutiny around that, as I said to Bruce Crawford, from our own parliamentary committees. Um, um, I think it's vital, given the, both the complexity of what we'll be dealing with, but also the import of what we'll be dealing with here, that the committees of this parliament are very, very closely engaged with this. Yes, I mean, one of the things myself and other conveners talked about was potentially a, a, you know, a committee debate, actually, uh, on, on this particular issue to uh, involve the wider parliament. But uh, moving on to another issue, uh, you, you just touched on the 2012 uh, Act. Uh, one of the things that came out of that effectively was the, the issue of the block grant adjustment. And over it took more than two years to get agreement on the block grant adjustment. Uh, what concerns do you have that this will um, create difficulties as we go forward, and what mechanisms can we have to ensure that that matter is dealt with transparently, and also that the Barnett formula becomes much more transparent? Because as uh, 
uh, Bruce touched on earlier on. It's, it's not particularly transparent and that we can actually scrutinise that and indeed the, the block grant as we go forward. Well, without, you know, kind of immediately being negative here, I, our experience of negotiating the block grant adjustment around the 2012 taxes, um, I suppose, doesn't in immediately make me all that optimistic about you know, the timescales and the, uh, the, the process that we are looking at for a, a fiscal framework that will be looking at similar kinds of adjustments around uh, a much broader uh, suite of, of policy areas. Uh, but on the other hand, it's got to be the case, in, in my view, because you know, we cannot allow ourselves as a parliament uh, to have uh, legislation being scrutinised and considered and certainly not agreed before we understand what the fiscal framework implications of that are. I think that would be uh, the parliament not fulfilling its responsibilities properly. Now, how do we make sure, firstly, that this process it happens in the, the requisite time scale and that there is sufficient scrutiny around it, you know, without throwing it straight back to uh, the, the people around the table. The committees are going to have a absolutely critical role to play in this, um, both in terms of making sure that the whole thing stays on track, but in really getting into the detail of it. Now, we as the Scottish Government will be as forthcoming as we can be with the committees in terms of making sure you've got the information and the material that you need to do that job. But you know, for the Finance Committee and for uh, Bruce Crawford's committee, you know, this is uh, as important, if not more important, than the scrutiny of the legislation. Now, when I met the Prime Minister on the day the command paper and the clauses uh, were published, you know, one of the points that you know, I made uh, to him was the importance of the fiscal framework and getting uh, as much work done around the fiscal framework. Now, John Swinney obviously will be uh, looking to have early discussions with, with the Chancellor and with Treasury uh, to make sure we get that work underway as quickly as possible. Thank you. Thank you. Paul Martin. Uh, First Minister, you'll be aware of the fact that the uh, the number of public services that have been delivered by the third sector, by charities and so-called arm's length companies has increased significantly over the last number of years. Uh, these organisations don't come under the audit framework of the Auditor General Scotland. Uh, I just wonder if this is something that the First Minister is looking at and the Government are looking at in terms of uh, taking us forward. Um, I'm more than happy if the Public Audit Committee feels that that's something we should be looking at to, to do that. Um, and I'm sure the Auditor General would have a, a view on this as well. Um, you're, you're right in the sense that uh, you know, there are more uh, services being delivered directly or with significant input from third sector organisations. Um, I know, because it's a, an area I had previous uh, portfolio responsibility for, you know, we have a similar debate in terms of freedom of information legislation where, you know, if I take Glasgow City Council, for example, which has outsourced many services to alios that weren't under the ambit of uh, freedom of information. So we have already uh, changed the freedom of information regime to bring uh, sporting and leisure organisations within the ambit of that. So I think we've got to make sure that we keep our procedures and processes up to date with the reality of how services are delivered. So it's not uh, something that we've taken any uh, decision on. It's not something we've come to any conclusion on. But I'm more than happy that we enter into uh, a, a discussion with, my, with the Public Audit Committee about that. I mean, can I just say with respect, though, is it not something that the government should have looked at? I mean, given you know, significant public sums that have been spent, I wouldn't expect the Audit Committee to have to lead and take that forward. I mean, is it something that the government, I mean, I mean in terms of governance of these organisations, is it not something that the government should have looked at over the last... The time? government will look at these things as we do with freedom of information on an ongoing basis. I'm more than happy to provide uh, more detailed information to your committee about what particular consideration uh, we've given. I, I wasn't suggesting that it was for the Public Audit Committee to take the lead. I was trying to be helpful in suggesting that, you know, as would be the case with any committee, if there was a, a dialogue that you wanted to have about how we uh, improve your ability to audit and scrutinise the use of public money, I'd be happy to, for the government to enter into that. No, is it not something that should have been looked at? The government, well, what I'm saying is the government will look at these things on an ongoing basis. I'm happy to provide you with written information about exactly what consideration we're giving. There'll be, as there is with freedom of information, there will be different uh, 
you know, different circumstances depending on you know, different uh, organisations and the degree to which they are uh, delivering public services. So it will not necessarily be a case of a blanket approach one way or the other, which is why some you know, detailed dialogue, I think, would probably be appropriate. I respect, President Officer, the point I'm actually making, though, the point in the question I've asked is, is it not something the government should have looked at uh, so that we can allow the Auditor General to scrutinise these organisations that you've already referred to, perhaps they should be in there, and would it not be best practice and, and for the government to ensure that these kind of organisations who are expending quite considerable public funds come within the yeah, remit of the Auditor General? Should, should it be something the government should lean on you? I think you know, I'm, I'm, I'm trying actually to agree with Paul Martin and to, to be to helpful me, here. I'm you what question. I'm saying is I, I'm offering to... Uh, send him and his committee detailed information of what consideration uh, in the different aspects of this the government will have uh, undertaken. Um, and what I'm saying is the government, as we you know, do on freedom of information, will consider these things uh, on an ongoing basis. Uh, but what I'm also saying, again, from my experience with the freedom of information legislation, is that there are often complexities here that mean it's not a blanket thing of uh, you know, one approach or another, it's more nuanced than that. So, you know, it's, it's up to uh, Paul Martin as convener of his committee as to whether he would want to be part of that dialogue, but I'd be very happy for that to happen. Very briefly. Just final point, just briefly, convener, just to clarify, presenter, so I'm not making the point that you're being unhelpful. I'm just asking the question, given the government have been in government for seven years, Surely, given the considerable public sums that have been spent here, it's something that should have been looked at by now and not something that the government should just begin to look at. We don't want this getting lost in the Bermuda Triangle of things that the government are looking at. I, I'm not suggesting that. I'm offering to send Paul Martin and his committee detailed information of what consideration, uh, in particular circumstances, the government will have, have given to that, you know, we're, we're the first government that has taken account of this in context of freedom of information legislation. So there is no uh, sense whatsoever that the government uh, doesn't want to make sure that we, our processes and procedures are taking account of the changing ways in which public services uh, are being delivered. Many uh, local, many third sector organisations, of course, uh, will be contracted by public bodies to deliver services that are themselves fully audited in terms of. Uh, these arrangements already. Stuart Stevenson. In his most recent annual report, the Commissioner for Ethical Standards and Public Life in Scotland highlighted that over 10 years, the number of applicants uh, who say they're disabled has risen from 2.4% of applicants to 131 and that's very welcome. He also welcomes the government's uh, approach to gender equality, but notes that over 10 years, the figure has not changed very much and currently sits at 34.1%. Uh, I wonder if the First Minister could uh, help us understand what initiatives the government might take to improve that. Well, I've made uh, very clear that I want to see significant progress around gender balance on public boards, private boards and third sector boards. Um, I've played a small part in leading by example over the uh, Scottish Government's Cabinet, which is, is now 50-50. Uh, we don't have power yet to legislate for quotas on public boards. It's one of the areas where we've been arguing that there should be early devolution of power, but to date we've not yet prevailed in that argument. So as soon as we do have that power, we would look at how we could use that to... Uh, legislate appropriately. But in the meantime, and I set this out in the programme for government, we are going to launch, and this will be launched again over the, the next few weeks, a, a Partnership for Change initiative, which is challenging public, private and third sector bodies to sign up to a 50-50 by 2020 pledge. Uh, and we're currently discussing with a range of organisations across these three sectors uh, their willingness to, to sign up to that. And it's about encouraging organisations to make a voluntary commitment to doing what we don't yet have the ability to mandate by law, but nevertheless, uh, that I would hope we can make significant progress around. You know, we are making progress on gender balance, but it's painfully, painfully slow. And if we leave it to the rate of progress we've seen over recent years, then, you know, the next generation of uh, female First Ministers and MSPs will still be sitting here talking about the need to make progress, and I don't want that to be the case. I would quite like this generation to fix it so that the next generation can worry about other things. 
The uh, command paper that's come from the UK government uh, shows in the draft legislation at section 24 uh, an intention to devolve the ability to set quotas for public boards. Now, in your previous answer, First Minister, you referred to private boards, and clearly there's no intention to devolve anything in that respect. Is it not the case that we need a stream of well-qualified and experienced women coming from beyond the public sector to feed into public positions, that unless and until we get that power as well, we're likely to continue to experience difficulties in getting suitably experienced and willing volunteers? Um, yes, I, I would agree with that. Um, firstly, we wanted the entirety of equality legislation and employment legislation to be devolved to the Parliament, but that's not yet being proposed. Um, I think, though, whether you're talking about public or private bodies and whether you're talking about doing this voluntarily or by quotas, uh, you do need to look at it not just in terms of the top levels of these organisations, although that's really important, but it's about the pipeline of uh, people coming into uh, these sectors or organisations that make it much easier over time for uh, women to, to get into uh, positions of seniority. And you know, I was uh, chairing this week on Monday the Scottish Energy Advisory Board, and we had a discussion about gender balance on boards. And you know, the point that was being made rightly by many of the people around that table was that you know we need to, if we're going to have 50/50 um, in you know the boardrooms of energy companies, then you know th yes, we should challenge them to do that very quickly. But to make that sustainable, we need to get more women coming into engineering and coming into the kind of professions that, that then go into these sectors and these companies. So we've got to tackle this at all levels. If there's a, you know, an argument against, well, I know there's several arguments against quotas, uh, but one of the arguments that would be used against quotas is that it's a blunt tool in the sense that it will help you uh, deal with the problem at one particular level of an organisation. It doesn't necessarily help you deal with the, the issues right throughout an organisation. But you know, I'm, my view on this has firmed up a lot in uh, recent years. You know, the progress we're making towards gender balance is too slow. Um, and uh, if the things we've been doing up until now have not delivered quicker progress, then we should probably tell ourselves we need to do different things. Um, and that's uh, the view, or why I've come to the view that quotas do have a role to play. But until we're in the position of being able to do more about that, we've got to put as much effort as we can behind the voluntary commitment. OK, thank you. Um, I've now got six minutes. Uh, so I'm going to call John Pentland and finally Nigel Dawn. So if you could keep it brief, I'd be grateful. Thank you, President Officer. Uh, First Minister, as one of the newer conveners, uh, I've been playing catch up on the uh, committee's previous business. And one of the things I have came across is that the Public Petitions Committee uh, regularly receives petitions on access to justice and openness of the ju judiciary systems. Uh, for example, uh, legal aid availability and rights to the unmarried father. Uh, now, I acknowledge recent legislation, uh, but I would like to ask what you, First Minister, and the Scottish Government are doing to make sure that uh, people do have meaningful access to, to, to justice. Um, I'll try to be as brief as possible. Obviously, there's a range of things the Scottish Government has done and will continue to do um, around court reform, for example, around making uh, it easier uh, for you know, victims or, or witnesses when we're talking about criminal justice to uh, participate in the, the justice process. Obviously, there have been significant changes to legal aid, and we are either consulting just now or about to consult. I can't uh, exactly remember, but we're about to consult on further uh, potential changes around uh, legal aid. Uh, so there's a whole range of things that we do to, to make sure that where people have got a need to access justice, then they're able to do that, and they're able to do that with the right support. Of course, there are always challenges around that, and all of us uh, see, I'm sure, in our constituency surgeries, many examples of people who find it difficult for a variety of different reasons to, to access justice. Some, some of these cases will be things that you know, there's not much we can do about. Others will be leading us towards further uh, reforms of, of the justice system. Um, if there are particular petitions uh, that give rise to this question that you want to point me in the direction of, I'd be very happy to look at the detail of them. Okay. <laughs> need to move on, Nigel Dawn. 
briefly. Mr. Presiding Officer, uh, First Minister, you'll be very well aware of the fact that the Legal Writings Bill is just about to get to stage three. That's the first piece of legislation through Delegated Power and Law Reform Committee. I'm wondering whether you give me some thoughts, please, as to how you feel we as a Parliament, with the assistance of the Government, can do more in the future to tidy up the law book, because we, at the end of the day, are the forum which has to look after and run the maintenance of the Scottish legal system. I think the, the Legal Writings Bill, which I know everybody's been following very closely, um, it's an important piece of uh, legal reform. Um, but I think... The, obviously, it's not yet completely through the legislative process, but the way in which your committee has led on that bill and the, the smooth passage of it so far, I think, is a, a good advert for the uh, new procedure in terms of law commission uh, proposed uh, pieces of legislation. And we're discussing with the law commission um, to ensure that we are able as government to identify at a very early stage what bills might be appropriate for that new procedure. And effect, as you know, effectively, you know, it's bills that don't raise any particular legal or financial or ECHR issues that would be appropriate for, for that kind of procedure. Uh, in terms of the programme for government in, uh, that we're talking about just now, it's uh, thought that the succession bill, uh, which is uh, due to be introduced in June, uh, assuming we can satisfy ourselves that it does meet the necessary criteria, it's thought that that will be the next bill uh, that is appropriate to be taken forward in terms of the, uh, the new procedure. Um, and, you know, that, as uh, you'll be aware, is a bill that deals with a lot of very technical issues around succession, not the kind of issues uh, around succession that are raised by some of the land reform issues. That will be, these will be the subject of, of separate legislation. Um, so I think the procedure, as far as I can observe, is, is working reasonably well, but we need to make sure we're making full use of it, because, as you rightly say, there is uh, a, an important function in terms of making sure that the law of the land remains fit for purpose and up to scratch and uh, regularly needs tidied up uh, in some key respects. Thank you very much, and thank you very much, uh, First Minister. I need to finish by two o'clock because the chamber is just about to start and I do not want to be the person who gets the blame for having meetings when the, when the Parliament is in session. Uh, so can I thank you very much for coming and for answering the questions today. Um, I will go back to the conveners group and we will have a discussion about the kind offer that you made uh, to come to be... Um, examined um, by the conveners group on a more regular basis. But for the moment, can I thank you very much on behalf of all the committee conveners. Thank you.